Palm Sunday has passed and the Redeemer has come. But the work of redemption is just about to begin. And the next week, Jesus will be visited by praise seekers and ridicule. He will be celebrated and betrayed and left alone to suffer the weighty penalty of a sin that he did not commit. But through it all, he will instruct, love on, and prepare his disciples to carry the mission of the gospel after he ascends to the Father. Tonight, we take a look at Christ's path to the cross in a unique experience that I pray will show you the weight of the steps he took and the path that opened for those of us who follow him as fully devoted disciples. This is The Road to Calvary. Oh, 
Jesus replied to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus responded, this voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus answered, The light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. Jesus said this, then went away and hid from them. Did you hear that? I swear it was a voice, booming from the heavens above. It spoke to him. It spoke about him, about Jesus. They think it was just thunder, just regular weather, but I know what I heard. God is getting ready to do something with Jesus. I know it. Yes, I know it, but he can't be the Messiah, can he? He was talking about dying, and the Messiah doesn't die, right? I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but God must be with this man. Have you seen the miracles? Have you heard the reports? He raised Lazarus from the dead for heaven's sake. God must be with him. I know it. John 12 shows us clearly how many in the crowds around Jesus wrestled with his identity. Through this story, we see Jesus through the eyes of the crowd. Sure, he did miraculous things and his teaching stirred something deep within their hearts, but was he really the Messiah? Many people today relate to this. They see the life change happening in others they know and maybe even agree with some ideas in scripture, but they ask, could Jesus really be who he said he was? Is he the Messiah, the only begotten son of our heavenly father? Was he truly God in the flesh? as we continue the road to Calvary, I want you to ask yourself, who do I know Jesus to be? Tonight, we pray you find the answer. is on the way. I hear a sound and it sounds like heaven. 
I want Him in my life. Oh, I hear a sound. I hear a sound. Yeah, it sounds like. It sounds like See, I want heaven. heaven. I want heaven in my life. Oh, I want heaven in my life. And when you step in, all fear.
response, God Almighty. Heaven, Christ, holy, holy, we respond. God Almighty, 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 heaven, Christ, holy, holy, we respond. They came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple and began to throw out those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. He was teaching them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the scribes heard it and started looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. Were you there? I was. Man, it was incredible that Jesus guy came into the temple and caused a big commotion. He flipped the tables over and was talking about God's house being for prayer rather than a den of robbers. No one could carry a thing past him. It was great. I felt like all those people selling things might have been taking advantage of us, but who knows? Apparently Jesus did because he challenged him. He challenged us. But the way he spoke, it was authoritative, but there was a care in his voice. He wasn't just accusing, he was correcting us, teaching us. Some of the religious leaders were acting like he threw a tantrum or something, but he caused a stir and then he used it to teach us about the kingdom of God. There's something different about this Jesus. I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you, he's different. This passage from Mark 11 tells the story of Jesus causing a commotion in the temple at Jerusalem. He tossed the tables of merchants and the Bible says that not a single person could get past him with items, but instead he captivated the crowd with his teaching. We often hear the story told with a focus on Jesus and his anger. But when we look at the text, it seems more likely that he was being stern but loving. The way he caused a commotion didn't drive people away. In fact, they were drawn to what he had to share. The only people who were angry were the religious leaders who were happy to let things continue as they were. 
You see, the religious leaders embrace the corruption of commercializing God's sacred space. They embrace power. They embrace hierarchy. And here is Jesus shifting the focus from monetary gain and man's influence to protecting the temple as a place to earnestly seek God. What a testimony of godliness. Could it be that Jesus was showing the way to God? Could Jesus be the one to follow? We pray you find the answer as we continue the road to Calvary.
one day in your house, bitter is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. Oh, nowhere else we'd rather be. Oh, nowhere else we'd rather be. Right in your presence. he was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came and said to him, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it amongst themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know its origin. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. I couldn't believe it. There we were listening to Jesus teaching and the scribes started questioning him on who gave him authority to teach. I thought they had him, like he was about to have really big problems, but then something happened that I never saw coming. He answered their question with a question. He asked them about John the Baptist, about the source of his baptism, and they answered, that they didn't know. Have you ever heard them say that about anything? Because I haven't. This Jesus guy, he's something else. It was really a sight to behold. This passage from Luke 20 shows how impactful Jesus' ministry had become by the time he reached Jerusalem. The scribes and Pharisees were now openly challenging Jesus' authority in public to try to discredit him or find a way to trip him up and even condemn him. But in trying to ensnare him, the religious leaders ended up giving Jesus the room to trip them up with a simple question. Where did John the Baptist's ministry of baptism come from? Heaven <laughs> or man? This answer would be problematic for them either way. The religious leaders did not embrace John the Baptist and his ministry, so to declare it from heaven would implicate them as being unconcerned with the things of God. To say it was human in origin would be to dismiss the people who embraced John the Baptist as a prophet. It was a lose, lose. And they decided to claim ignorance rather than risk upsetting the people. They were not able to delegitimize Jesus. Many people disagree with Jesus, but how many can prove him wrong? Have you thought about this? Well, tonight, a prayer for you is that you come to see Jesus is authorized by God the Father to lead you and me to life everlasting. If a man of the word all things are possible. 
Sitting across from the temple treasury, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Then a poor widow came. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Then a poor woman came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others, for they all gave out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. I thought I was being really generous. I thought I was giving a lot. We talked about tithing and giving our first fruits and the scribes remind us all the time, but nothing prepared me for what we saw today. Sitting in the temple, we watched the people giving and all these people who look wealthy gave large amounts. It was so much being given that I was generally impressed, but that's not what changed my perspective on giving. After all those rich people came, a widow came and she put in two small coins, nothing more than a few cents. I didn't think much of it until Jesus called us together about it. He said that it might seem like she gave so little, but in fact, she had given everything she had. And that is far more generous, far more faithful than those wealthy people who gave large sums. Could I have faith like that? Could I give God everything? Jesus changed everything I thought about giving in that one moment. I'm still changed by it. The widow in Mark 12 is one of the most challenging figures in scripture. She didn't have much at all and instead of trying to preserve what little she had, she gave it all to the work of God by faith. Jesus sitting with the disciples pointed out this woman as the example rather than the wealthy people who were easily uh, giving all of these large sums of money. What lesson? Here it is. Generosity and faith are not calls to simply give a lot, but rather to make a significant personal sacrifice through faith for the glory of God. God calls us to giving as an act of worship. It demonstrates our trust in him and our care for others through supporting the work of ministry. But we can only answer this call through faith in Christ. Tonight, my prayer for you is that you come, give your life and faith to Jesus so that you may give generously and faithfully to the work he does to bless people through our church. Your mercy 
overflows Your blessing is a river On and on and on it goes You are an endless fountain You're filling up my life My heart must sing your praises Jesus, you be glorified Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, 
he loved them to the end. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. I couldn't believe it. Jesus, our Jesus, the Christ, knelt down to wash our feet. We are not worthy. Who are we that Jesus will wash our feet? He's been casting out demons, raising people from the dead, healing the sick. He's literally done the miraculous and he's kneeling to clean our feet. What manner of love is this? What kind of leader serves like this when he is so clearly powerful and holy? And what standard does that set for me? You know, I've always been moved by this story of Jesus kneeling to wash the feet of the disciples. Here is the savior of the world, healer of the sick, son of God, preparing to die on the cross for a sin that he did not commit. And he's not seeking recognition or wallowing in his emotions or reveling in discomfort. No, he was modeling servant leadership. He led by his example of service. Jesus taught the disciples that leading was not about the titles and posturing for reputation but rather earnestly and intentionally serving others. By this example, he showed that these were not merely words. Leaders serve, leaders care, leaders love. These are the attributes we hope you come to see in Jesus as we continue our road to Calvary.
When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. I see it so clearly now. Jesus is truly the Messiah. Who else could embody love like this? He has taught us. He has trained us. He has empowered us. He has challenged us. He has loved us. This week, has been beyond words. You can see people's lives changed as he has taught them and healed them. Even the scribes and Pharisees seem to have been challenged in unspoken ways. But we heard Jesus in our own ears. The time is coming when he will be offered up for our sins. I would be so focused on my own and myself, but he is focused on others. He commanded to love as he's loved. Wow, I mean, how do we do something so special? I just feel blessed that I have experienced it. May his love inspire me. No, empower me to give grace like he has given it to me. Truly, God is with us. Jesus' call to love is a challenging invitation and an even more powerful reminder of the God we serve. He calls us to follow him in life, in ministry, and most of all, in how we love others. This shows Jesus is God. He is who he said he was. Who else could love like this? Who else makes it possible for us to love like this? Only God, only Jesus. I pray you experience this love in your life tonight. God, thank you for your love. Your love that's faithful, it's always there. You haven't forgotten about us. Even in our homes, you're right there with us. Your presence, your love is all around us. Mm, yeah. Come on, let's just go a little deeper here. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me yeah. And you have been so, so kind to me Oh 
this one Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of this wind And mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by your glory I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so And we are his portion He is our prize Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes And grace is an ocean We're all seeking yeah. So heaven is like a passionate kiss And my heart turns violently inside of my Tonight, we experience the road to Calvary through the eyes of those who witnessed Jesus in the week leading to the cross. Remember, some were skeptical. Some were open to the idea of Jesus as Messiah. And still others were convinced that Jesus was what he claimed to be in John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life. You may have experienced firsthand the way that Jesus changes lives and does the miraculous. But who is he to you? Do you know him for yourself? Because he is the way to God. He is the fulfillment of God's truth and law. He is the way to life eternal. Do you know him as the way, the truth, and the life? Do you know him as your Savior and Lord? Tonight is your chance to make that choice. On your screen, you can see how you can connect with us by text, email, or phone call. If you're making a decision to trust God today, reach out. If you need a church home to live your faith in community, reach out. If you need prayer, we're here for you. Reach out. And as you reach out, I'd like to pray for you. Lord, thank you for the road to Calvary as we continue our road to redemption. We pray that tonight you have impacted hearts in a significant way and that you will prompt a response from the viewer. For those who need to know you, we pray you bring them to call upon your name and receive salvation. For those who do, do know you, we pray that you would give them a place to experience community and encouragement here at The View. And for those in need of prayer, we pray that you would meet their needs according to your will. We pray each one would respond now and receive what they need from you, in Jesus' name. Amen.
This week we will finish this amazing story of love, hope, and redemption. And you are invited to join us every step of the way. Info on our remaining Easter week activities is on the screen now, or you can learn more at easteratthevue.com. Plan to join us and invite others along with you so that they experience Jesus and the loving redemption he offers to each of us. But for now, let's worship together one more time. We love you, God loves you, and God bless you.
out church and do whatever you want do whatever you want to God and I will make room